Hey, Lunarnet. It's Matt here for the Dork Lords. I'm actually doing a quick drop-in. I'd already recorded this week's video, uh, but then Amazon uh, came out with some really important news, so I thought I would add this to the beginning. Uh, and that is that our first definitive named character has been cast for the Amazon series. And that is Galadriel. Galadriel is going to be played by Morvid Clark. Um, she was last seen in His Dark Materials, HBO. I've actually really enjoyed that show. She's playing Sister Clara. She's also been in Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies. She was in Crawl. She's been in a few different projects. Um, but uh, yeah, now she's landed this gigantic role, Galadriel, in Amazon's Lord of the Rings series. Um, the other news, which is maybe a week old now or so, is that Will Poulter has dropped out of the series. There was some conjecture, maybe he was going to be playing Elrond, people didn't know exactly uh, what part he was going to play, but due to scheduling problems, he has dropped out. That's unfortunate, because he's a, he's a talented actor, he, he would have been an asset to the show. I suppose better now than to be, you know, get halfway through the first season and then drop out, so um, that's a unfortunate, but, uh, you know, it happens. Actors get scheduling issues. The one thing I would say is that, you know, if you're going to agree to do this show, you feel like your schedule's going to be kind of taken up for the next seven years or so. But in any case, uh, that's a shame, but the Gladriel news, very cool. And now, back to our regularly scheduled program. Voila. Hey, Internet, it's Matt here for the Dork Lords. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We talk about all manner of dorkly things here, so whether it's sci-fi, fantasy, superheroes, we probably have a playlist about it. Feel free to check us out. Today is another in our Dork Lord of the Rings segments. And today's topic comes to us from commenter Noncare, who asked for a video about the Red Book of Westmarch. Um, also, there was another commenter, Metacell Tales, who made a comment about that comment. Uh, and I'll get to that because uh, it was very insightful uh, and helped with this video. So thank you to both Noncare and Metacell Tales. All right, the Red Book of Westmarch. Now, you know, I knew generally about the Red Book, um, but this research uh, gave me things that I didn't know about. Uh, so uh, hopefully I can pass that along to you. What I went into this uh, knowing about was that uh, Bilbo uh, was working on his diary uh, in, in The Hobbit. Eventually Frodo took over and wrote more, you know, during The Lord of the Rings and uh, passed stuff off to Sam as he went off to the West. Uh, and that's kind of what I knew about. But there's a lot more to the Red Book of Westmarch. I'm going to read you a passage that uh, describes, in some ways, kind of the title page. This is Frodo. He's handing the book off to Sam uh, at the end of The Lord of the Rings, and we get a glimpse uh, to what is on the pages of the Red Book of Westmarch. In the next day or two, Frodo went through his papers with Sam. There was a big book with plain red leather covers. Its tall pages were now almost filled. At the beginning, there were many leaves covered with Bilbo's thin, wandering hand, but most of it was written in Frodo's firm, flowing script. It was divided into chapters, but chapter 80 was unfinished, and after that were some blank leaves. The title page had many titles on it, crossed out one after another. So, My Diary, My Unexpected Journey, There and Back Again, and What Happened After, Adventures of Five Hobbits, the Tale of the Great Ring, compiled by Bilbo Baggins from his own observations and the accounts of his friends. What we did in the War of the Ring. Here, Bilbo's hand ended, and Frodo had written, The Downfall of the Lord of the Rings and the Return of the King, as seen by the Little People, being the memoirs of Bilbo and Frodo of the Shire, supplemented by the accounts of their friends and the learning of the wise together with extracts from books of lore translated by Bilbo in Rivendell. "'Why, you've nearly finished it, Mr. Frodo!' Sam exclaimed. 
Well, you have kept at it, I must say. I have quite finished, Sam, said Frodo. The last pages are for you. So that sets it. I love the fact that the titles are just uh, s- scratched out. Like, my diary. Nope. My unexpected journey. Nope. There and back again. Nope. Like, the, <laughs> the story kept going. There's more to write. So, yeah. So we see that originally this, this red, what it becomes known as the Red Book of Westmarch, starts off as Bilbo's diary. He passes it off to Frodo. Frodo continues the story. And now um, Frodo is about to uh, journey west. Uh, as a ring bearer, and uh, there's a really touching scene between Frodo and Sam, where Frodo is leaving and Sam is staying, and uh, it, it's a very, it's a very sad scene actually. But part of that conversation, uh, I'm going to read you here. This is Frodo talking to Sam and talking about the importance of the Red Book. You will be the mayor, of course, as long as you want to be, and the most famous gardener in history and you will read things out of the Red Book and keep alive the memory of the age that is gone so that people will remember the great danger and so love their beloved land all the more. And that will keep you as busy and as happy as anyone can be as long as your part of the story goes on. So that's what uh, he informs Sam of. Sam does continue uh, with the book and then Obviously, after uh, the death of his wife, Sam goes to the West. Uh, and we have here from the appendices uh, a little description of how he then passes the book off to his daughter, Eleanor. 1482, death of Mistress Rose, wife of Master Samwise, on Mid Year's Day. On September 22nd, Master Samwise rides out from Bag End. He comes to the Tower Hills and is last seen by Eleanor, to whom he gives the red book afterwards kept by the Fairbairns. Among them, the tradition is handed down from Eleanor that Samwise passed the towers and went to the Grey Havens and passed over sea, last of the ring bearers. So we see it goes from Bilbo to Frodo to Sam to Eleanor. And that's where it ended up staying. Uh, I'm going to read you a passage here in a second uh, that talks about Westmarch. But eventually, the, Eleanor and, and her family end up staying in what becomes known as Westmarch. Hence, the book gets the title Red Book of Westmarch. And you can see this joy in, in writing and chronicling that... Tolkien has, obviously, right? I mean, this guy is an academic, first and foremost. He did a translation of Beowulf. Um, this stuff is right up his alley. And like, if he was Bilbo, of course he'd keep a diary and track all the history and, you know, pass it on. This would be the most important aspect, probably, of his life. So he, you can see he infuses this story with that sense of, uh, of import for the Red Book of Westmarch. It is the basis, you know, for the known facts of of his mythology. Here's a passage that really gets to the meat of what constitutes the Red Book of Westmarch. As I'll read to you here, it's not simply a diary. It's actually five volumes, and the volumes uh, contain different information. Um, So here you go, description of the Red Book. By the end of the first century of the Fourth Age, there were already to be found in the Shire several libraries that contained many historical books and records. The largest of these collections were probably at Undertowers, at Great Smiles, and at Brandy Hall. This account of the end of the Third Age is drawn mainly from the Red Book of Westmarch. That most important source for the history of the War of the Ring was so called because it was long preserved at Undertowers, the home of the Fairbairns, Wardens of the Westmarch. It was in origin Bilbo's private diary, which he took with him to Rivendell. Frodo brought it back to the Shire, together with many loose leaves of notes, and he nearly filled its pages with his account of the war. But annexed to it, probably in a single red case, 
were the three large volumes bound in red leather that Bilbo gave to him as a parting gift. To these four volumes, there was added in Westmarch a fifth containing commentaries, genealogies, and various other matters concerning the Hobbit members of the Fellowship. The original Red Book has not been preserved, but many copies were made, especially of the first volume, for the use of the descendants of the children of Master Samwise. The most important copy, however, has a different history. It was kept at great smiles, but it was written in Gondor, probably at the request of the great-grandson of Peregrine. Its southern scribe appended this note. Findigil, King's writer, finished this work in 172. It is an exact copy in all details of the Thane's book in Minas Tirith. That book was a copy made at the request of King Elisar of the Red Book of the Perianath and was brought to him by the Thane Peregrine when he retired to Gondor. The Thane's book was thus the first copy made of the Red Book and contained much that was later omitted or lost. All right, I know that's a lot to take in. And again, you can see Tolkien really interested in the fine details of chronicling. Um, one thing it mentions, uh, it calls the Red Book of Westmarch also the Red Book of the Perianath. The Perianath was another name for halflings, for hobbits. So the Red Book of the Hobbits is the same thing as the Red Book of Westmarch. So uh, the three places mentioned in that passage, the Undertowers, the Great Smiles, and Brandy Hall, uh, those are all connected to different members of the Fellowship. Undertowers, the family from Samwise. Great Smiles, that's Pippin's family. And Brandy Hall would be Meriadoc, Brandy Buck. And they all have libraries at them. I think that's really interesting. Again, showing Tolkien's influence. What would he do in the situation? He would chronicle the events that they lived through. So Under Towers, um, as, as I mentioned, that is where uh, Sam ended up giving the book to Eleanor, his daughter. Um, and it's so called because it is under the White Towers. The White Towers are west of the Shire, kind of very close to the shoreline. And those are towers built by uh, the Elven King Gilgalad uh, for Elendil. Elendil placed a palantir in those towers that gazes west. And in fact, the elves make kind of an annual pilgrimage to the towers to look upon the palantir and gaze west and perhaps get a glimpse of uh, uh, Varda, who they call Elbereth. I, did, I talked about this in uh, a video about uh, Gildor and Glorian, in case you want to know more about the White Towers. And under towers, I'm assuming that uh, that particular estate, if you looked up, you'd probably see the White Towers kind of looming overhead uh, at, at, from, this, from this house. A couple little side notes. Um, one thing, I guess I didn't realize this, uh, but when I was looking at Sam's children, he has many children uh, with Rosie Cotton. Uh, one of them is Eleanor, obviously. But he also has a uh, little kid, Frodo, Mary, Pippin, and Bilbo um, among them. So he actually named several of his children after his closest friends. Uh, he also has a daughter named Goldilocks. Uh, he names his daughters after flowers. And so uh, Goldilocks marries Faramir, who is Pippin's son. So Sam's daughter ended up marrying uh, Pippin's son, Goldilocks and Faramir. Of course, he named Faramir because Pippin had a close relationship with Faramir um, and, and an association with Gondor. And that association is why we see this thing called the Thane's Book. He's the Thane that is mentioned there when they talk about the Thane's Book. So Aragorn requested a copy of the Red Book of Westmarch from Pippin. Pippin obliged, brought that to Gondor. Then Aragorn's scribe made an exact copy and that book ended up going back to the Shire to stay at the Great Smiles, where it still lingers, you know, in, in the libraries of the Tooks, 
of uh, of Pippin's family. Interestingly, uh, that's a very important book because it's the only version that contains these extra three volumes. Remember, if I'm when I was talking about how um, the Red Book was a, was five volumes. The first one, is, the first book is this diary. The fifth book is a bunch of genealogies and some other information. It's the middle three books were given as a gift from Bilbo to Frodo. And they are called Translations from the Elvish. And those are all but lost, except in this one copy that this dutiful scribe, Findigil, uh, was, you know, probably went blind doing it, but he uh, made an exact copy of the translations from the Elvish, which describes all the elder days and such. And this is while Bilbo's in Rivendell, he's got a whole bunch of source material. You know, you got Elrond there, you've got Glorfindel there, you've got some uh, some heavy hitters, and Bilbo uh, was very dutiful to write all this information down. And so that's that Thane, Thane's book. That's really what it's particularly known for is it holds uh, that incredible, you know, bounty of great information. So to put a pin on the uh, Pippin's relationship to Gondor here in the Fourth Age after the war, um, you know, he obviously he was a member of the Guard. He had pledged himself to Denethor. Uh, Aragorn makes him a knight. Gondor... And, you know, he's, he goes to the Shire, he's a hero, he has a family, but eventually he retires. He and Mary both retire. Mary has this connection to Rohan, obviously, right? Uh, he was with Eowyn at the Battle of Pelennor Fields. Um, you know, he has a lot of allegiance to Rohan in that moment. So they both journeyed to Rohan and Gondor, and eventually Mary uh, dies of old age uh, in Rohan, and Pippin dies in Gondor. And years later, when Aragorn passes away, actually Merry and Pippin, uh, their bodies are placed next to Aragorn. Uh, you know, this huge place of honor uh, with these, these two hobbits placed next to, uh, to the body of the king. And while Pippin didn't write so much, uh, he did collect a lot of works, uh, specifically about Elendil and his family, his heirs, hence, uh, you know, Aragorn eventually, uh, and also the history of Numenor. And those are a lot of the resources that he kept at Great Smiles, uh, his, his home. Mary actually did his own writing. He wrote a few books, and obviously I mentioned he's got a library at Brandy Hall, and so his books would have been there. He wrote uh, Herblore of the Shire, he wrote A Reckoning of the Years, which compared the calendars of the Shire with that of Rivendell and Gondor and Rohan, obviously. And he also wrote a work called Old Words and Names in the Shire, which compared uh, some of the Shire words with perhaps having uh, uh, origins uh, in, with the Rohirrim. Again, showing his connection to Rohan and his fascination with it. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so Mary wrote several works as well. And Mary and Pippin feature very heavily in the kind of post-War of the Ring portions of uh, the Red Book. Uh, here's a little excerpt talking about the Battle of Bywater. So ended the Battle of Bywater, 1419, the last battle fought in the Shire. In consequence, though it happily cost very few lives, it has a chapter to itself in the Red Book, and the names of all those who took part were made into a roll and learned by heart by Shire historians. At the top of the roll, in all accounts, stand the names of captains Meriadoc and Peregrine. So you see how important they were to the community of the Shire after they returned. Now, as I looked through uh, the various uh, books to find some more references to the Red Book, I found a really cool uh, notation that um, I'd kind of forgotten about. And this describes how Bilbo actually lied in the Red Book about his encounter with Gollum. And basically made himself look a little more heroic than the guy who stole the ring. 
Um, and so uh, I'm going to read you that passage right now. But it's really, it's really fascinating. And it also hints at the fact that maybe the ring is starting to have an effect on him when he's trying to write the account of how he got it. Now, it is a curious fact that this is not the story as Bilbo first told it to his companions. To them, his account was that Gollum had promised to give him a present if he won the game. But when Gollum went to fetch it from his island, he found the treasure was gone, a magic ring, which had been given to him long ago on his birthday. Bilbo guessed that this was the very ring that he had found, and as he had won the game, it was already his by right. But being in a tight place, he said nothing about it and made Gollum show him the way out as a reward instead of a present. This account Bilbo set down in his memoirs, and he seems never to have altered it himself, not even after the Council of Elrond. Evidently, it still appeared in the original Red Book, as it did in several of the copies and abstracts. But many copies contain the true account as an alternative, derived no doubt from notes by Frodo or Samwise, both of whom learned the truth though they seem to have been unwilling to delete anything actually written by the old hobbit himself. Gandalf, however, disbelieved Bilbo's first story as soon as he heard it, and he continued to be very curious about the ring. Eventually, he got the true tale out of Bilbo after much questioning, which for a while strained their friendship. So, yeah, you can see here how Bilbo changed the events around to say, like, uh, yeah, you know, he was going to give me the ring anyway. Then he couldn't find it because I had already found it. But, you know, since I'd won the game, I mean, it was mine by right, so I got it. Uh, it was a present. You know, it's kind of like my birthday present, in a way. Um, so, yeah, and I like it's interesting how, you know, Gandalf pushes the issue with him to the point that it strains their friendship. Uh, it's a little fascinating look into... Um, how, you know, there is a point of view to this story that um, we can't always take our writer uh, at face value. Might be, might be changing events to make themselves look a little better. Um, anyway, a really interesting little tidbit there. So it was Metaceled Tales that told me about uh, one of the influences for Tolkien using the Red Book of Westmarch. And that influence is the Red Book of Her Guest. I had not heard of this. I had to look this up. Um, so thank you, Metacell Tales. Um, but the Red Book of Her Guest is a collection of Welsh myths. It's one of the most influential medieval manuscripts in existence. It's written in Welsh. It deals with these very Welsh legends, this oral tradition that finally got uh, captured in writing. Um, it's mentions legends from the Mabinogian, uh, which again is this, this Welsh history, essentially, that's encapsulated in myth form. And uh, it actually brings up Arthur quite a bit. King Arthur uh, shows up uh, in these stories. And so you can see how it's, a, it's like an anthology of stories uh, that are also historical in nature. And it's obviously got the red cover, the red book of her guest. You can imagine how uh, Tolkien borrowed from that idea to say the Red Book of Westmarch. It's, 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 it's an anthology in some ways of all these different authors writing what amounts to a history of this region. Um, but I also found there's another uh, influence um, on this book, and it's the Red Fairy Book. It was written, it's a series of children's fairy tales written uh, in the late 1800s by this Andrew Lang and his wife. They, again, they collected an anthology. They didn't write these things necessarily, but they collected uh, fairy tales. And they put them in this book, uh, several of them. They had the blue fairy book and the red fairy book and so on and so forth. But we know that Tolkien as a child read the red fairy book. And shortly after publishing The Hobbit, uh, Tolkien actually gave a lecture on this author, Andrew Lang, and the importance of fairy tales. It shows you how uh, you know he was thinking about this Red Fairy book around the time that he was uh, writing and publishing The Hobbit. One of the things that's in the Red Fairy book is uh, the legend of Siegfried. And Siegfried, 
his big foe is Fafnir, the dragon. Fafnir is a talking dragon, has a giant treasure hoard, talks to the hero, um, and there's even a magic ring in that story. So you see, obviously, Smaug kind of leaps right off the page there when you're thinking about giant talking dragons uh, and big treasure hoards. Uh, I also noticed that I just looked through the titles of the Red Fairy book. One of them is called Soria Moria Castle. I don't know if that perhaps the word Moria maybe stuck in his brain years later when he was working on Moria. But um, in any case, um, this uh, I think this Red Fairy book is also uh, a big influence on the Red Book of Westmarch. Um, so I'm going to finish off with what may indeed be the last words of uh, probably what would be the first volume of the Red Book. Uh, right, remember, there's the five volumes. The first one is the diary, and it does all these accounts. Um, and uh, what we see here is the, there's a passage, Tolkien writes, and he prefaces the passage with, here follows one of the last notes in the Red Book. Uh, and so I read it for that reason. We have heard tell that Legolas took Gimli, Glow in the Sun, with him because of their great friendship, greater than any that has been between elf and dwarf. If this is true, then it is strange indeed that a dwarf should be willing to leave Middle-earth for any love, or that the Eldar should receive him, or that the lords of the West should permit it, but it is said that Gimli went also out of desire to see again the beauty of Galadriel. And it may be that she, being mighty among the Eldar, obtained this grace for him. More cannot be said of this matter. And so that is among the last lines from the Red Book. After the death of Aragorn, and obviously uh, Merry and Pippin are laid beside him, Legolas decides it's time to leave. He leaves, but he doesn't leave without his friend Gimli, who agrees to go to the west, the only dwarf ever to get granted access to the Undying Lands. And this part of the Red Book uh, guesses that perhaps uh, Gimli was granted access by way of Galadriel. And that also, that was part of his inspiration for going, because he was leaving these glittering caves. He was the lord of the glittering caves. He had a really cool society that he was the leader of. Um, and he's giving all that up to be with his friend Legolas, and perhaps uh, to uh, see Galadriel again. Um, so, in any case, uh, the Red Book. It's Tolkien's own voice, in a way, coming through into uh, the tale of the Lord of the Rings. Um, it shows his passion uh, for academia, his passion for chronicling, and it really helps sell the the tangibility, the 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 reality of this mythical place. That there are people in it that are writing their own accounts of this place. It it, um, it just makes it feel more lived in, more real uh, than it would otherwise. Um, so I'm a big fan of the Red Book of Westmarch. Thank you for suggesting the topic, non-care. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed researching uh, this one. I, I learned a lot more uh, than I thought I would. So awesome. Um, thank you so much. If you've got a topic you'd like me to talk about, feel free to put it in the comments. I will add it to my list, my ever-growing list of cool topics from you guys uh, to talk about. So thanks so much, and I will see you next time. Bye!